Okay, so essentially my talk is about connecting two set of issues that might at first seem unrelated. Uh, the first set is related to neural variability, and the other is probabilistic representations. Um, and the idea is that there might, that uh, you argue that there is a theoretical framework in which the two can be naturally linked, and that generates interesting predictions. Okay, so neural variability, I don't think it really needs to be introduced to this audience, but just to make sure that we are all on the same page. It's, uh, what, I'm, what I mean by it is that neural responses in the cortex, as well as elsewhere in the brain, are variable. You present exactly the same signals over and over again, and every time, in every trial, you get a slightly or quite a bit different response. So here I'm showing examples from visual cortex, because that's what I'm going to use in the rest of my talk as my running example, although um, the principles that I'm going to cover are supposed to be uh, fairly uh, general. So what you see here is this is recording from the primary visual cortex, uh, in Jonathan Victor's lab in this case. Um, this is, these are just two examples. There's many, many, many examples of this in the literature. We present exactly the same frozen noise stimulus. So it's noisy, but you can present exactly the same noisy stimulus on um, repeated trials. And here you can see the spike rain of the same cell over repeated trials. And there's an awful lot of variability across trials. There is some kind of um, consistent uh, part to this response, which you can recover by a PSDH or a post stimulus time histogram by essentially averaging across trials in time bins, in consecutive time bins, but there's an awful lot of variability. Same story in MT, the actual stimulus is slightly different. Here it's randomly moving dots. Again, this, it looks random, but you can repeat exactly the same randomness with the same random seed, and again, you, you record um, variable uh, responses. Okay, so this has been phenomenon that has long been known in your sense, and essentially the way um, we have been thinking about this is that phenomenologically, it's mostly regarded as Poisson-like. So if that it obeys, you know, uh, Poisson-like statistics, you know, the, maybe the variance scales with the, 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 the variance of spike counts scales with the mean of spike counts. Uh, we have seen examples for this in previous talks, so I don't need to explain it any further. Now, uh, functionally, the main framework in which this variability has been looked at is that of neural coding, where people are actually interested in you know, how much information there is between stimulus and response, and so on and so forth. Um, and in that context, any variability is essentially a kind of nuisance. It's noise, and we would be much better off with, 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 le with less variable responses. Um, in this talk, what I would like to uh, argue for is that phenologically there is very interesting properties of, of neural variability that don't really fit into this Poisson like picture. There's structured spontaneous uh, uh, activity um, in the absence of any stimuli. Uh, there's spontaneous activity and it's structured. It is not trivial statistical structure. And moreover, just as mean responses are modulated by stimuli, which we all know, they are called tuning curves or receptive fields, so is the variability of responses modulated systematically by stimuli. Uh, and rather than thinking about it in terms of a, a, a coding framework, I would like to uh, uh, put it in the framework of computation and in particular how variability can be used uh, for, uh, to represent uncertainty. Okay, so I've told you about neural variability. What kind of uncertainty am I talking about? Uh, and this, you know, uncertainty is really kind of plaguing all levels of um, recession information. I'll be concentrating here on relatively low levels uh, low-level sources of uh, uncertainty because the exponential data that I will then present is from B1, a fairly low-level visual cortical area. Um, but again, the the, the principles uh, should generalize uh, to higher levels as well, or in principle could generalize. It's an empirical question that you do. Um, okay, so low-level uh, sources of perceptual uncertainty. Um, I'm just again going to give you a handful of example, a handful of, uh, of examples. There's many many other sources. Uh, but just to give you a feel, obviously when we decrease the contrast of an image, our uncertainty about what's in the image increases. Uh, there's a fundamental uncertainty uh, because the world outside is 3D, three-dimensional, yet we only see two-dimensional two projections uh, on our uh, retina. Um, there are stimuli that are just fundamentally ambiguous, such as uh, you know, uh, stimuli that are used to study bicycle perceptions. There's also the value on average problem. Again, this is something that, for example, among many others, the other device has studied uh, in uh, connection with, with, with uncertainty given by contrast. So uh, the aperture problem is essentially a fundamental problem that we only ever 
um, perceive a little part of the surrounding environment and each little part by itself might be very ambiguous as to what's outside. So just by, look, just by seeing this much through the keyhole of our sensor systems, we can't be sure whether this kind of environment is outside or this kind of environment is outside. Um, and so these are really very fundamental sources of uncertainty uh, in, in perception. And so kind of the mathematically honest and uh, consistent way of dealing with uncertainty is to formalize it as a probability distribution. And in particular, the kind of distributions that we are thinking about are posterior distributions over particular features of the visual world that we might be interested in. Eventually, these should be features that are useful for control, but we're not going that far. Um, so some features um, that, that are relevant um, given the stimulus. And the important thing is that the stimulus by itself doesn't uh, give us complete and perfect information about the identity and, and properties of those features. The best we can do is to infer a whole posterior distribution over possible combinations of features that might be out there given the stimulus that we see. Okay, so if this is really what our kind of uh, perceptual system should uh, should uh, somehow encode in neural activity, then the question, then naturally the question arises: How does actually neural activity encode at least approximately um, such posterior distributions? And there has been a couple of suggestions out there on the market. And I would like to focus on one particular suggestion that we, as well as others, have, uh, uh, have been uh, considering. And so essentially, this, this suggestion for how uh, uncertainty is represented in neurons creates a direct link between perceptual uncertainty and neural variability via something that is, uh, that is sampling. Uh, and if you are someone who knows a bit of machine learning, I'm essentially talking about Monte Carlo-based uh, approximate probabilistic inference. Uh, uh, approximation uh, re representations or Markov chain Monte Carlo in particular. So just to give you an example, imagine this is the stimulus. You have two neurons in, in V1 that care about the presence of uh, two visual features. One of them represents the whether and how much this particular feature is present in the current image or in the environment. The other one cares about this one, the blue one. Um, and so for this particular image, you might, the, the posterior distribution that you might want to represent might look something like this. And you know, obviously this is cartoon toy example, all I want to emphasize is that you know, this posterior distribution in general will have you know, order, correlations and statistical dependencies of all orders, or you know, there is some correlation, there is some higher order dependencies and all that in general. Okay, so now let's look at the other side um, of the world, which is what's happening in the brain. So I can record the activity of the red cell over time, and you know, it's, it's going to change over time, um, as even for a static image usually. Um, I can also record the response of cell 2 for the same image, uh, again, over time. But now what I can also do, I can actually plot the activities of these two cells against each other, uh, as in a phase plane or a state space. Okay? And now if I replot the same trajectory in this space, I'll get a weekly line that looks a bit like this, maybe. And essentially all what kind of the sampling hypothesis, what, what we call the sampling hypothesis says, is that if you look at the distribution of neural activities in this space, in neural activity space, that distribution should match the distribution of features that you are trying to represent, the posterior distribution of features. So each cell represents, in this simple case, the, the intensity of a visual feature, and so the distribution of the cell's activity uh, jointly encodes a joint posterior distribution in feature space. And so we were not the first to kind of consider this possibility, but in some sense we are probably the first to really try to take it seriously and link it directly to a, you know, experimental observations. Um, yeah. No, this is a good time to ask because everything else depends on, on this. So if you don't understand this, this is this is time to ask questions. So Edu Atheson had a paper. Pardon me? Edu Atheson had a paper this year that he claimed that um, vision is the same as the We are not at all sure, and I will, I'll let me get back to the question at the very end of my talk. I'm giving here your simplistic, uh, I don't, so it doesn't, at a very fundamental level, it doesn't really change things, but at a practical level it will, and I will get back to that at the very end of my talk as an open question, okay? Um, so let's just keep that in mind. Um, okay, and, um, and of course if the stimulus changes, then the posterior distribution over these features that want to represent changes and the distribution of regular activities should change accordingly, according to this theory. Okay, 
So this is a fairly abstract theory. The question is how do we go uh, about testing it? And so uh, what I will do now is that I'll show you two ways of testing it. One is something that we thought was as assumption free, that is free of additional assumptions over what the theory already defines as possible. And, and in the other one, we really commit ourselves to more specifics and then make more, more specific predictions as well. OK, so um, how do we test uh, neural hallmarks of something? And so here's the general idea. Um, imagine that uh, you are a ferret. This is not the ghost of a ferret. This is an actual ferret here. Looking at, uh, looking at the visual image and uh, record uh, the neural activity of, of the, the distribution of neural activities in response to this image in the visual cortex of the ferret. Okay? So uh, in response to this image, there's going to be a particular distribution of features uh, that ought to be represented if, if the something kind of uh, hypothesis holds. For a different image, there is going to be another distribution of features that needs to be represented, and so forth and so on for other images. Okay, now we have, what we are going to do is that we are going to also record that in response to a very specific visual stimulus, which is a blank room. Okay, so it's like a, a, a completely dark room, a, a blank image, if you like, um, in total darkness. Uh, the animals are still not sleeping, they're just sitting there still in total darkness. These are awake animals, by the way. Um, and we record something that, in this case, is actually called spontaneous activity because, you know, even though there is, literally, there is a stimulus, the dark room, but for historical reasons, this kind of activity is called spontaneous activity. So formally, we can say that, okay, this is activity recorded in response to a stimulus that happens to be, you know, a vector of zeros, if I want to encode this uh, in some way. But on the relatively mild assumptions, we can also show that in a wide class of internal models that the cortex might, uh, might be interested in, in entertaining, uh, this posterior distribution happens to be equivalent to the prior distribution over visual features uh, under that model. And I'll give you one specific example for such a model uh, in the second part of my talk, uh, where this is actually formally true. Uh, but it turns out that almost all sensible models of, of, of uh, how, you know, what kind of features the visual cortex should represent should really have this property essentially because you don't want to spend too many bits uh, for including a completely blank image. So that's, if you like, that's the information theoretic uh, motivation for, for having such a model. Okay, so now if this, if this holds, and this is kind of the only additional assumption that we need here, which I would argue is still a relatively wide assumption, then we, can, uh, then we can do one additional line of trivial algebra, uh, which is that we rewrite the prior of the uh, of the model, the internal model that the, that the cortex uh, implements, if you like, as the average of the posterior over the distribution of stimuli that the internal model of the cortex uh, expects to see. Why is that useful? Uh, why is this way of rewriting the prior useful? Well, because I can now compare this distribution to another distribution, which I simply get by averaging together these distributions, the evoked activity distributions. So notice that I'm not talking about the average activity of neurons. We are averaging distributions together as if, you know, lay, laying on top of each other, laying down on top of each other. So I kind of merge these distributions together. I get an average of activity distribution. And formally, what that means mathematically is that this distribution is, again, um, under the summing hypothesis, is the posterior distribution for each stimulus, but then the average of the distribution over the distribution of, uh, of images, right? The, the distribution of images that we used in the first place. And for now, we are going to use natural images. So these are sampled from the, the natural, kind of natural image statistics, if you like. OK. Sorry, sorry. Yeah? So in the bottom, mm -hmm. that could be seen as a definition of p modal state, right? This. Yeah, so this is kind of the predictive distribution of the internal model. What is the distribution of stimuli that it expects? This is so the actual distribution, p natural state. This is, the, this is controlled by the external. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yes. I'm still confused. I mean, yep. there's something inconsistent statistically in this, in this assumption. Because strictly speaking, which, which assumption? This assumption. This one. This this one. Where it means that essentially stimulus zero has no information. Yeah. But uh, yep. these features should, should still remain the the average of over the stimulus. These features give the stimulus. Yeah. So. So unless the stimulus zero never occurs, or or occurs only. Uh, is inconsistent with the, with the consistent marginal. I'm not sure what, uh, let's continue and then maybe we can discuss what you think is inconsistent here. I don't actually think there is any statistical inconsistency. 
inconsistency. It's not an approximation. You can think about it as an approximation, but it can never be all exactly. No, it, it will not hold exactly. Yes. Uh, it will hold, uh, what I will show is an example of a model where for if you look at the marginal of this posterior over all but one variable, then it holds exactly. And so um, that's, that's, that, that's essentially uh, the key point, yes. So in that sense, that's, that's, you know, that's one of the ways in which this approximately can be understood. Yeah. Uh, OK, so why is this interesting now? Because now we can see that these two formulae are almost the same. The only difference here is that here we are averaging over the predictive density of the, of the internal model, whereas here we are averaging over the actual distribution of natural stimuli, if we use natural stimuli in our experiment in the first place. So now we are going to make the second assumption, the second additional assumption, which is that we will assume that the cortex is adapted either or on an evolutionary time scale or an ontogenetic time scale, we don't know, and for these purposes we don't even care, um, to the distribution of, of natural images. And that's an assumption that has often been made in system general science before us, so that's, we are not you know, the first to make that assumption at least. Okay, but now we actually have an interesting way of testing that assumption linked with the assumption of a sampling based representation of uncertainty. Why is that interesting? Because now, if this distribution, that essentially means that p-natural state is the same as p-model state. In other words, the internal model is adapted to natural uh, image statistics, which means that if that is true, then these two quantities should really be the same. So in other words, the distribution of average aerobic activity and the distribution of spontaneous activity should be very similar. So if you haven't followed the math, don't worry. There's a very simple intuition for this, is that if you have a good internal model of your environment, then your average inferences should match your prior expectations. So when I was sitting in my office before coming here, imagine that I had never been to Jerusalem, which is almost true. Uh, and I was trying to imagine what Jerusalem was like. I've never been to the Middle East, I suppose. Um, so I imagined something like, you know, my usual kind of Western or maybe Eastern European experience. And I come here, and it's nothing like that. It's much more exciting. It's much more intense. So my average inferences are mismatched from my prior expectations, which is what I had sitting back in my office. Now I go home. You keep reminding me a couple of more times. And so after that, when I sit in my office at home, when I imagine what Jerusalem will be like, it will be much better matched to what I actually experience here when I'm here. So that's kind of the uh, intuitive explanation for this uh, piece of mathematics. OK, so now we can actually make, a, uh, uh, we can actually, uh, make it even more interesting by saying that, OK, maybe over development, again, we are not making claims whether it's, this is experience dependent or not. We are just saying that maybe over development, uh, it is the case that in young animals, the internal model is not that well matched to the environment yet. So in that case, uh, we don't expect the similarity between the average evoked and, and uh, spontaneous activity distributions. Moreover, and perhaps even more importantly, when we use artificial stimuli rather than natural stimuli, we should again not expect a match between these two distributions because now these two distributions don't match in the first place. So when we put them inside these, these intervals, there is no reason to expect that the intervals turn out to be uh, equivalent. So these are now experimental testable predictions that we can go ahead and test. And so the way uh, we tested them is that, uh, first of all, when I say B, what I really mean is my experimental collaborators, Joseph Fisher's lab at Brandeis at the time. Uh, my group is the Cure Theory group. Uh, so they did experiments uh, um, with a behaving ferrets. Um, ferrets are a very interesting model uh, species for these because they are well known to have a, a, a developmental trajectory where their visual system keeps developing after eye opening. So we start experiments right at the time of time eye opening all the way to very mature animals. Uh, people usually don't uh, look at the uh, uh, ferrets of this, this age. Uh, cla by, in classical terms, the visual development is supposed to have finished roughly by uh, P80. It turns out that with our measures, there's something interesting happening still uh, much later. Um, and multi-unit recordings from uh, kind of superficial layers of V1, 16 electrodes. Okay, so the kind of data that we get is, you know, uh, spikes over 16 electrodes uh, over, over time. We binarize, so these are not isolated single units, these are each, uh, each channel is a, is, is a multi-unit uh, recording. Um, and uh, we binarize these, so this is the usual kind of, if you like the Schneck, especially in this country, I can say it's the Schneck one at all kind of uh, uh, way of treating this data. So we binarize it in two millisecond time bins. We have a one uh, for, uh, for an electrode on which there was a spike in that time bin and a zero when there wasn't. Um, and so in, that means that in each, at each time step, in each two millisecond time bin, we have a 16-digit binary word. 
uh, for the 16 electrodes. And now what we do is something very simple. We construct the histogram of the 16 digit binary words. There are 65,536 of them. We measure the frequency, the frequency in which they occur over time. Um, uh, uh, and first do it during spontaneous activity, so in darkness. Then we repeat the same thing uh, in the same visible condition. Uh, so again, same 65,536 uh, binary words, measure the frequency in which they occur, um, either in, in, in a condition where we use uh, natural scene movies, and for some reason my collaborator uh, took the, the movie Matrix as a natural image movie, but for the purposes of recording from the one, it's probably all right. I wouldn't bet too much on it if you, you know, wanted to record from higher visual cortices. Or, um, and, uh, and then we can essentially measure the dissimilar dissimilarity of these two distributions using information theoretic measures such as the KI divergence. And of course, you need to be very super careful when you measure these quantities in actual data, which is always kind of undersampled. And we've taken great care to kind of measure, measure it reliably. And I can, I'm very happy to discuss how, how we exactly did it. We essentially combined previously uh, these approaches by Stefano Panzeri with some other kind, of, which are more frequent corrections with some Bayesian uh, corrections as well. And so we are fairly confident that we have a reliable measure of KL images from, from our data. Let me just finish and then we'll get back to your question. Uh, and then we uh, repeat the same thing in, the, uh, in, you know, in different stimulus conditions when we use different stimuli, such as bi binary block noise or uh, drifting sinusoidal gradings. And then we not only do it for what we call spatial patterns, but we also do it for temporal patterns when we concatenate two uh, consecutive, uh, the, the, the words that we, uh, that we get in two consecutive time bins separated by some time, which we can vary parametrically. So that's what we call temporal patterns. Question? Just a clarification. Uh -huh. Is that binary? Is that real data? This? The binary. Oh, this one. Well, this is a binary rendition of this. Now, whether this is real, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's binary system illustration. I will show the real data in a minute, but uh, it was looking exactly like this. Yeah. Yeah, and if there is more than one, just ignore it. Now it turns out that there only a very small fraction of time beings includes more than one spice. These are time and so small. If these were like isolated single units, we would never expect more than one spike in a in time beam, but since they are not, we sometimes have, but it's like below five percent of the of the so it, it doesn't matter. Uh, we can repeat the same analysis just using those beams where there was strictly no more than one spike and it's it, 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 it's stable. Um, no, these are all dynamic images. But for the analysis it doesn't really matter, it turns out. So for the theory. Uh, we can get back to that if you want at the end, but it, it really doesn't. Okay. Okay, so here is kind of Row data is row as it gets at least, uh, which is you see two strips of activity over time across uh, the 16 channels is spontaneous and movie avoid activity. White means lots of spikes, gray means less spikes, black means no spikes. Uh, and this is in a young juvenile animal, right? I open P29, and we can replot this kind of data in a way, uh, in a scatter plot that looks like this, where each dot is one of the 65,536 patterns. And the two coordinates show you the occurrence frequency of that particular pattern during movie avoid and spontaneous activity. And what you see here, and notice it's a log log scale, so notice that there is quite a big discrepancy uh, in spontaneous and movie level distributions because this distribution lies way off the diagonal. And the same thing in an adult animal looks like this. Now the dots are nicely lined, uh, along, uh, line, lining up along the diagonal. Uh, obviously here we are, have some issues. Uh, but uh, now they are really... Um, Kind of the, the two distributions seem to match uh, each other very nicely. So now we can actually go ahead and, and uh, quantify it using the other versions. And what you see is that there is a very strong and systematic drop over development in the divergence between movie air mode and spontaneous activity. Okay. Yeah? Pattern frequency defined is defined by Euclid, right? By that What do you mean? No, we just record it. We just record for, you know. No, 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 this, this is spiking patterns. This is the frequency with which these 16 digit binary words appear in our recordings. This is not about the, the stimulus, this is all about neural activity, right? Okay. Um, okay, and then we can test whether, you know, whether this is really just driven by single neuron firing rates, whether the, that the single neuron firing rates in the two conditions get more, become more similar, or is it due to kind of more interesting correlations or higher order correlations? And we use maximum entropy models, which again should be a uh, kind of should go without exploration for this audience. Uh, so we use maximum entropy models to test for the role of correlations. 
Um, so we essentially what we do is that we take the original distribution of, of uh, neural activity, of population activity, and then uh, use different surrogates to construct our maximum entropy models. Uh, we take a, a maximum entropy model that essentially is only constrained by the finding rate of each channel. That's kind of the classical maximum entropy model, first order maximum entropy model by Schneidman et al. Um, we can also construct another set of constraints, which kind of uh, respects the distribution of population rates. Like, you know, how often did, you know, 10 uh, electrodes, uh, uh, how often were 10 electrodes simultaneously active or 4 electrodes simultaneously active and so forth. So that's kind of the population rate dis uh, distribution. That's another constraint. And we, com we can also combine these two constraints and that defines yet another maximum entropy model. And so any deviation of the true distribution from these uh, surrogates means that there is interesting stuff uh, happening beyond what is dictated by these relatively simple low-level summary statistics uh, of the activity that we reported. And to cut this long story short, we see that uh, correlations increase over both during movie evolution and spontaneous activity over development, and their role in matching correlations between movie evolution and spontaneous also becomes increasingly uh, more important. Um, so mean finding rates do not account for our main results, and we can use kind of this more sophisticated uh, control uh, suggested by Open et al. Uh, and essentially, the main results uh, again are the same. So uh, again, correlations, non-trivial correlations, increase over development, both in movie evolution and spontaneous activity, and their and their role in matching movie evolution and spontaneous activity again uh, increases over development. So. Not only mean finding rates, but mean finding rates and population rate distributions do not account for the mean results. So it's really correlations beyond what would be expected by these relatively trivial low-level summary statistics. We can do the same kind of analysis for temporal correlations, which I will not go into in the interest of time. Um, and the main story is the same, is that again temporal correlations matter, just as spatial correlations do. Um, and finally, this is kind of the um, uh, the test that I uh, that I already referred to at the very beginning of my talk. Uh, we can also test what happens um, uh, what happens when we use non-natural movie uh, evoked uh, stimuli, and it turns out that in, uh, in the in the older stage group, not before that, but in the uh, older stage group, there's a significant difference in how different these evoked activity distributions are from spontaneous activity. So, uh, kind of artificial stimuli evoked uh, distributions are from from spontaneous activity than movie evoked, and that's so that's this uh, significant difference there. Okay, uh, I'll skip this and um, uh, go for the second part of the talk. Uh, okay, so as I said, these were all relatively model-free assumptions. At least I didn't really, you know, I was talking about posterior somewhat candidly, if you like. I was talking about posterior distributions without ever specifying a particular generative model on, under which you compute posterior distributions. Now that's obviously a nonsense because a posterior distribution is always under some particular generative model, I was arguing that there is a wide class of generative models under which these predictions would remain the same, but now I'm going to actually specify one particular generative model to be able to derive more specific predictions from this theoretical framework. So the generative model is again a generative model of natural images, right? This is, um, this is kind of the classical field of you know, trying to understand uh, what what models, what generative models are good at uh, reproducing the statistics of natural, uh, of natural images and then trying to understand what, for example, V1 does in terms of V1 uh, implementing some form of approximate inference under uh, such a generative model. If you want, the kind of the classical Olsen field uh, paper can be seen as one example of this general framework. So this is um, the same lines but with one crucial difference and I'll show you in a moment what the crucial difference is. Okay, so here's a Here's the generative model. We essentially assume that each image x is given by some linear combination of, uh, of, uh, of uh, basis features. Actually, I realized that the equation is not quite right uh, because the y's are the activations of these features, and so each y multiplies this basis function with which it, uh, it contributes to the image. So imagine that each y is multiplying the, the corresponding basis function here. Okay. And so, uh, we will add one twist to that, which is that we will assume that there is a multiplicative factor here that essentially sets the overall contrast level of the whole image. Um, 
So that's, that's kind of the single variable that I was talking about previously. Okay, and this kind of model is well known. It, it was uh, introduced into the field of natural image statistics by Everson and Chalian colleagues. It's called the Gaussian scale mixture model because we also have a prior distribution over the device, which is a multivariate normal distribution or, or a Gaussian, multivariate Gaussian. Okay, so it, this generative model for natural images turns out to be just plainly and actually quite a good generative model of natural image textures at, at least. We are really not talking about full images right now, just patches. And it turns out to be a very decent generative model of natural image patches. So there's just very good a priori statistical motivation for it, for taking it at least half seriously as an internal model that the cortex might be interested in inverting, if you like. Okay. And of course, we will also uh, assume that there is some noise that the model can't capture by itself, so there's just some additional additive noise there, uh, just to uh, make it more flexible. Okay, so this is the geometry model of natural images. What we're going to be interested in is, is uh, how the cortex inverts this model and goes back from an image and infers the activations of these basis functions. Okay, so I'm, what I'm not going to talk about is mechanistically how might that happen, what kind of network dynamics may uh, give rise to that. That's the bit that I have to cut out because my talk just got shortened. Uh, but if you're interested, I'm very happy to answer questions about it uh, after my talk. Um, so I'll just assume that, let's assume that there is some cortical dynamics that is able to produce samples from that posterior distribution. And in particular, what I will assume is that there's two more steps to it. One is that um, we will assume that memory potentials represent these y-latent variables through a kind of a very weak nonlinear transformation. So it's, the u's are the u's that are the memory potentials are ex are almost exactly like the y's, uh, plus a little bit of nonlinearity. And again, I'm very happy to tell you afterwards why we needed that little additional nonlinearity. Most of the things in our model don't really depend on that. And then the filing rates are generated by kind of a standard procedure where we essentially uh, take the memory potentials through a threshold uh, nonlinear function with a given threshold and, and exponent and, and, uh, and overall uh, kind of rate scale. And so from that we get filing rates. And then uh, in each trial we can integrate the filing rates and create spikes based on them. Uh, uh, whenever the, inter the cumulative filing rate crosses an integer. And, it, uh, and so there's no additional stochastic stochasticity here, there's no additional possible step, but because the underlying memory potentials are stochastic, the, the spike frames that we record in the end will look stochastic from trial to trial. Okay? And so now um, I can again go back to my favorite representation, which is plotting memory potentials against each other, like here or here in the two trials, and then uh, I can also plot spike counts of these two neurons in the two trials or in many trials, and I can look at the distribution of memory potentials or spike counts across trials uh, in response to the same image. And from here on, um, the name of the game is going to be the following. I present an image to this model. Uh, I record the distribution of memory potentials and spike counts in response to that image. I present the same image to an animal. Well, we don't do the you know, uh, uh, experimentalists have done it uh, for us. But we use the same kind of stimuli that they did. We present the same stimulus uh, to an animal and record memory potential distributions or spike count distributions. And we can compare the theoretically predicted response distributions to the experimentally recorded experimental uh, distributions one to one. And importantly, most of the parameters of our model are directly derived from the parameters of the generative model, which is only matched to the statistics of natural images, not to any neural data. The only parameters uh, that are used to fit the neural data there's four parameters uh, essentially describing these two transformations. One of them we just took from the literature, and we tuned three parameters to match all the data that we, uh, that we fitted across a number of different experiments, and in fact, um, at least two different species. Some of the data that I'm going to show you is from an SSI cats, some other are from awake uh, monkeys. Okay, so, but once you fix those parameters, there is no more parameters to play with for any stimulus that you, that you show to the model. You record, uh, you know, you can get response distributions and you, compare, you can compare those response distributions to response distributions in real anim animals that are shown the same type of images. And that's a very direct test of the theory. Okay, so uh, just to situate it in the, in the, uh, in the uh, binary theoretical literature, essentially we are really kind of uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. These kind of generative models have been proposed to underlie uh, uh, you know, the inferences that the visual cortex makes and account for a host of uh, neural as well as psychophysical data 
uh, in 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 the one or in, in low level uh, visual uh, perception uh, with two shortcomings. One is that computationally they had no representation of uncertainty. Essentially, all of these models can be shown to correspond to maximum equals theory inference under a geometry model that is like our Gaussian scale nature or a special case of this. And biologically, there was no notion of variability. If you gave these models an input, every time they gave you exactly the same output. So essentially, one way to see our contribution here is that we applied something that I think is one of the most powerful principles in computational neuroscience, the, which I call the problem annihilation principle, where you take a computational problem and a biological problem and you make them annihilate such that now we have a model which, in which the, rather than doing deterministic inference, we do Bayesian inference, essentially under the same class of geometry models, and we reproduce everything, pretty much, that previously have been shown uh, to work with deterministic inference, but on top of that, we also account for uh, a number of phenomena related to neural variability in the cortex. Okay, so here we go. Uh, so just to give you a, a, an insight into how the model works, uh, what I'm showing here is three different images at a very, very low contrast level. So you can't even distinguish between them. So that's the red, the blue, and the green framed uh, little image patch. And what I show you is the inference of the model about this underlying Z contrast variable. And so this inference is very, very uh, near zero here, as you can see. And on here, uh, I show you the uh, posterior distributions and samples from those posterior distributions for two different features or uh, for two different cells that represent those two features. And here I'm showing the mean of these posteriors. So here you see the full posterior distribution, as it were. Here you just see the means of these posterior distributions. The black cross and the black uh, dashed ellipse shows you the prior. And so you can see that, uh, sorry, and so you can see that at, at very low contrast, the posterior very closely matches the, the prior. Uh, at higher contrast, the posteriors get more differentiated from the prior. We infer a higher contrast indeed. So now we are showing these, these three images. Uh, the inferred contrast becomes higher. Uh, our posteriors become different. Here in yellow, we also see the posterior means for many other natural image patches. And at even higher contrast levels, uh, you know, these posteriors become even better uh, differentiated. So now, essentially what I will do, I'll go through a number of interesting uh, properties that you can observe in the model, in this plot, and show how they predict particular aspects of uh, neural variability as reported experimentally. So the first thing that I would like to draw your attention to is that as we increase contrast level, noise variability de decreases. So the, each posterior covariance ellipse uh, shrinks. And that again is, is pretty clear where it's coming from because once you infer that z is close to zero, these variables are unconstrained essentially. The only thing that constrains them is the prior. And on average, uh, since on average any image should add information to the system, on average the posterior entropy and under some assumptions that also holds for the variance or covariance, should be smaller than the prior entropy or variance uh, and covariance. So that means that as you increase contrast, uh, neural variability is, is, uh, uh, is really ought to decrease. So that, that is actually uh, a well-known phenomenon. This is known as you know, stimulus onset quenching neural variability that has been described in a host of uh, different cortical areas. Here I'm showing you results from the model here. Uh, in terms of membrane potentials, so this is actual membrane potential recordings in the model in response to shifting sinusoidal grading stimulus uh, at the preferred orientation or non-preferred orientation. And the main thing to look at is that the, the error bars uh, shrink at the moment when uh, uh, the stimulus is presented. Um, and we can also characterize on average what the variance is doing acro uh, across all orientations, and you can see that there is a drop in variance. And essentially the same thing has been observed experimentally. This phenomenon uh, generalizes to fan factors, which, contrary to somewhat common belief, are not constant, uh, but they change as stimulus onset. They drop quite significantly, both in the model and, uh, and in experiments. So, um, and this is again shown uh, also by these, uh, by these bar plots here. Okay, so this is uh, our analysis of awake monkey recordings done in the lab of Andreas Stolias. Um, and this is analysis that was done in, uh, by Church and the Tony. Okay, so, um, but we don't, we don't have to go to the extreme case. You don't have to go from a zero to a 100% contrast stimulus. You can, go to, you can also compare intermediate contrast levels with high contrast levels. And essentially, the, the main message is the same. Is that uh, when you go to a, when you just compare a low contrast other than a completely blank stimulus to a high contrast uh, 
stimulus, you essentially get the same kind of phenomenon. Both memory potential variances shrink as you go from low contrast to high contrast. Um, and, and sorry, these are the memory potential variances, and these are the fan effectors in the model and in the experiments. Okay, so that was the first uh, interesting phenomenon. Um, the second is that actually when you change orientation, um, in, con in contrast to what happens when you change contrast, uh, noise variability barely changes. So that you can see here that all these different stimuli that are at the same contrast level, their posteriors are very different, but the posterior covariances are actually not that different at all. They are very similar. And again, that comes out uh, quite naturally from the model. And here, here are the actual model predictions in terms of memory potentials and uh, fan effectors. And you can see that even though both the mean and the variance of spike counts is very strongly modulated by the orientation of the stimulus, the f they are co-modulated in a way that the fan factor, which is really just the ratio of the two, remains constant, again, both in the experiment and in the model. There is a slight modulation of, of memory potential variance, and uh, that has to do with the little nonlinearity that we had um, uh, mapping from the Y variables, the kind of the abstract visual feature variables to the memory potentials. And if you're interested, we can go back to that at the end of my talk. Okay, um, notice that when contrast increases, not only signal variability, sorry, noise variability goes down, but signal variability increases, meaning that the means of these distributions become increasingly separated, and that's exactly what signal variability measures. It measures the variability of, of the mean response across different stimuli. So that is shown by the scatter of the yellow uh, uh, rhombi on these, uh, on the, uh, the, the, the yellow diamonds on these plots. Um, and uh, it turns out that you can, you, can, uh, you can turn that prediction together. So when noise variability goes down and signal variability goes up, um, it turns out that uh, when you increase the aperture of an image, you essentially increase the, uh, the uh, effective contrast level of the image, because there is just more activity coming in through the input, um, which, as we saw, decreases noise variability, increases signal variability, and it's actually quite easy to see that that is uh, going to increase the sparseness of your responses. <laughs> and so in the model you can see that when, uh, what happens when you compare uh, stimuli in which, which are only presented in the classical receptive field of a cell or when they cover both the classical and the non-classical receptive field, which essentially means that we have increased the aperture of the visual stimulus, the inferred level of contrast increases, just as we would have expected in the model, so the distribution of Z uh, in the two conditions. Uh, noise variability decreases, uh, that's uh, what these two uh, uh, areas show in the two uh, cases. Whereas signal variability, these are the two error bars, so this is the mean response over uh, CRF and CRF plus and CRF stimulation. Signal variability increases, which altogether makes the response sparser, um, as seen uh, in experiments. And here we are quantifying both the reliability of memory potential responses and the sparseness of finding great responses in the model and in the experiment. And, in, and as a corollary of that, there's really nothing very special about it. Once you make your responses sparser, of course that will cause uh, signal correlations to go down uh, in the system. Um, and just as we expect, that's what we get in the model. And that is, again, what has been reported experimentally uh, in uh, the Ganta. Um, so uh, that was uh, this phenomenon. Then, as I have shown you already in the experimental evidence, uh, spontaneous activity distribution is the same as the average evoked activity distribution. But now I have defined one specific model for which this actually holds true, except for the Z variable, but all the Y variables. Uh, in the space of the Y variable, in the subspace of Y variables, it holds. And there's good statistical arguments why we expect the Z variables to be less in number than, than the Y variables. Um, and just to show you it in, a, in an interesting way that, is, that you don't see it very often, uh, presented, I think, uh, and somewhat surprising maybe at first, is that if you, what happens if you compare the firing rates, the evoked firing rates of neurons um, at different contrast levels to their firing rates in, during spontaneous activity. And so each dot is a different neuron. And this is really going against the classic view that you would get from an exercise animal when you expect, you know, tunicers just to scale up altogether with higher contrast. And you can see that essentially all these, at all these contrast levels, roughly the firing rates by and large remain unchanged. Uh, from, their, from the average firing rates in spontaneous activity. But of course, we can make this more detailed comparison that we did in the, in the first half of the, uh, of, the, of the talk, when we compare uh, evoked activity, average evoked activity to spontaneous activity distribution, and you can see that it's not significantly different from a baseline that we expect us to do uh, something, you know, under something of the data. Uh, 
we had that one in the in the in the experimental paper. I just didn't draw your attention to it, but because we have limited amount of data, of course we don't expect to see an exactly zero KR divergence. So this line shows you what is the given the amount of data that we have, what is the minimal amount of divergence that you expect to see, and we are right on top of that. On the other hand, if you compare evoked activity to the shuffled uh, kind of the firing rate control maximum entropy model, uh, then the match doesn't exist anymore. And again, this is just comparing what happens if you use different artificial stimuli uh, to, uh, to evoke activity in the visual cortex. And again, both in the model and, uh, and in the experiments, you get the best match when you use natural images and not when you use different sorts of artificial images. Okay, finally, um, spontaneous correlations. Uh, we can also show, it's a, it's a relatively simple piece of algebra, that we also expect spontaneous correlations, that's the black ellipse, to be similar to signal correlations. So the shape of these ellipses uh, should, uh, should be the same. And, uh, sorry, the signal correlations are actually uh, the, the, the yellow ellipse here. And we also expect signal correlations to be similar to noise correlations. So uh, the signal correlations, again, is the yellow ellipse, and the noise correlations are these blue, red, and, 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 and green ellipses. So we can show mathematically that these are all uh, approximate equalities that we expect under the Gaussian scale mission model. And we can test them uh, in data. Uh, and again, we see a reasonably good match in that signal correlation. You know, for higher signal correlations, you get higher spontaneous correlations, and for uh, and also higher noise correlations. So this is something that has been again described previously in many different systems. You just repeat that. Uh, this is something that we predicted uh, quite specifically, um, and this just shows the overall distribution of noise correlations in the model, just to show that it's very the, the mean is very near zero, um, and and in the data. Okay, um, so I'm finishing now. Um, essentially, um, what I've told you about was a purely representational model. I said that if the visual cortex, in particular the primary visual cortex, represents samples from a posterior distribution under something like the Gaussian scale mission model, that actually predicts patterns of variability and covariability that are experimentally observable in the visual cortex. What I did not talk about is what dynamics might be responsible for that. Uh, and so that's something that uh, we are working on currently. And if you're interested, I'm very happy to talk about some of the preliminary work that we have done uh, about that. But for now, I'll stop here and just summarize. Uh, so I was arguing that sampling, or Monte Carlo, uh, or Markovchik Monte Carlo in particular, is a simple and powerful way of representing uncertainty. It can be efficiently implemented by ER neural circuit dynamics. That's a bit that I haven't got time to show you. But there's some backup slides if you're interested. And it provides a natural account of neural variability, the match between evoked and, uh, and spontaneous activity. And if we specify it further uh, as you know, inferences under a Gaussian scale mixture model and map it to beam responses, we can also explain things like changes in signal and noise variability with contrast and aperture and lack of changes in orientation and the similarity of signal noise and spontaneous correlations. Um, there's many, many open issues. Here I'm just emphasizing one, and this goes back straight to the question that Reza asked at the very beginning. Um, what about dynamical inference? What about things like evidence integration? What about what happens when the stimulus itself is changing? So you ought to do something like filtering, just as we heard in the previous talk by Ron. Uh, how do you do that with a something based representation? And I think that's a very interesting, deep, and uh, challenging open question. And that is, again, something that we are uh, working on, but we don't even have primary results on that, just uh, some ideas. And with that, I would like to thank my collaborators, in particular Joseph Fischer, who, uh, who has done all the ferret recordings, and Pietro Berkes, who, who did all the analysis of the ferret data, Gergo Orban, um, who did kind of the more detailed analysis of the GSM model and comparing it to uh, VMA responses. And then the bit that I didn't get to talk about, uh, about the actual network dynamics, is, uh, is by Guillaume Marquin and Lawrence Hitchison. Guillaume is the positive in my lab, he's now faculty in Cambridge. Lawrence is currently positive in my lab. And uh, also generous funding by the Bible Trust and the for it. Thanks.